I'm going to be talking about business sensibilities when developing on to Bitcoin SV. So um, also please ask questions and we will address those at the end of the presentation. I think this one will be relatively short, so we should be able to get to the Q&A. All right, so I'll go ahead and get started here. So the objectives of it is to talk about the approach for starting a Bitcoin business talk about the importance of revenue generation from day one because of its ease. This notion of co-opetition, meaning how we are all have our incentives aligned, but obviously some, as a business, you want more Bitcoins than the other business, or you want to generate more than your competitors. Yet you are kind of working together since we're all in the same ledger. How micropayments enables the new internet um, lots of things were added to the internet because micropayments weren't. And I'm going to talk about how we can change our mentality with that in mind. And then do's and don'ts when operating in the Bitcoin space. All right, so I, I mentioned this some time ago, three months ago. Bitcoin app should be generating revenue in the alpha. And this is not to imply that you guys should be profitable or even myself should be profitable because of how small and early we all still are but because of how easy it is to do it in your application with the different tools like Money Button and just this, the simple power of Bitcoin outputs. So it's so trivial to pay yourselves in the output. Um, it, it's just no, it's no reason not to do it. So you can advertise and signal on chain by using what, what's been popular lately with vanity addresses. So whether that's in your Bitcoin protocol, you know, that's your prefix for all your transactions on chain, or whether that's where you receive them. I mean, there's privacy issues there, but there's uses for it as well. So like, I know Baymail uses one, Twitch uses one, different apps are starting to use these. To, and it's like advertising. So when people go to the Block Explorer, they see, oh, this one's done X amount of transactions and they look, and there's the name of the app. Um, also, when you start paying people in different outputs, you keep your uh, employees motivated. Like imagine open up your wallet and you just see payments constantly throughout the day. That would, you know, okay, I get a thousand Satoshis here, 10,000 there, a hundred thousand there. I, I think, you know, I know personally for me, that makes me want to earn more ASAP. Okay, this was a relatively new service. Uh, it's called Dimely and the tagline is your time is worth a dime. Most, we've all heard the saying that time is money. Well, we should treat it as so. Domly is still immature, but I think that I would, we should see more businesses using this. So if we're building on Bitcoin, we should be using Bitcoin, right? So I know one thing, I see this in the Slack chats and telegrams where people are asking questions and this stuff is valuable, right? Well, I think a lot of people would like to call different individuals based off their particular set of knowledge and maybe pay for that. I think that's valuable. And then that would also give that person a way to generate income stream for themselves. So, you know, imagine uh, some of these businesses where the guy puts himself out there for an hour and, you know, maybe the rate is a dollar or 50 cents a minute. And now he's actually opening himself up to maybe the people that are using his service or he just, you know, is, you know, giving out knowledge that can help other people build on top of Bitcoin. So I, I think this is important. I would like, I know it's kind of, it had a boom and it's kind of uh, less users over the last few months, but I would like to see this come back and um, be used because I think it, it has applications. And we're, especially since we're so niche, right? Um, that a lot of knowledge is in different people's minds, but not necessarily out there in the public. And you know, if people make themselves available, I think there would be demand for their knowledge and they would be willing to pay for it. Okay, this features app, this has been a recent trend. So uh, different sites have added these features pages where they allow crowdfunding on chain of different things that they could add to their site. So for example, here, Twitch has direct messages, video calls, and this is a good way to communicate the roadmap without disclosing the necessary direction, right? Because lots of folks wanna keep the roadmap private for obvious reasons, but this is, it's open yet there's no, like the penalty for revealing what you would work on is that you get money. 
So uh, this makes sense to do for, and you could release a subset of features, right? And you could just let people kind of vote with their Bitcoins what they want to see from you. And then you'd be held accountable to deliver this. So if you know one of these gets funded, if it, if it sits there for a long amount of time and the funds start moving, you could see that on chain, people will start asking questions and say, hey, what are these guys doing? Did they just exit scam? So I think this is a great way to show your users what you're willing to work on, but also show what you're not willing to work on. So you could price a feature absurdly high to say, hey, I'll do this even though I don't want to, but the price is gonna be high. And it also sets the expectations with your customers about what you're working on. So that the, the users can know what to expect, what's coming, and they can also understand why something hasn't been delivered. So you know, if everyone's asking for a same feature, well, they can just come here and say, oh, okay, well, it needs nine more Bitcoins to fund and maybe I should contribute to that. And then they could also feel like they're a part of the decision-making process where they're not being dictated what the company thinks is valuable, but where they're kind of collaborating with everyone, including the business owners, about what they want to see added to an app that they use. All right, collaboration, I, I think this is kind of a theme of this presentation. So I, I think that because we're all building on the same ledger that integrating with as many services as possible is so important because lots of other people have built things that we can use. And it, it's better to do that obviously than it is to kind of make your own thing. You don't want to be working on low level stuff when other people have already built something that you can use. It also makes you keep the line of communication open with other businesses. So that way, no, double work isn't being done. So if you're working on something that you know you need for your app, it would make sense to check what's out there first and talk to others. So you can also get a gist of what they're working on. So you know, excuse me, not to duplicate and you know not to like reinvent, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. And you can also learn from them about what can potentially be done, what can be added, and maybe even some uh, inside information on what's going on between different businesses. You also give the users opportunities to use these different tools and apps. So if like with RelayX here, they display all these different Bitcoin businesses inside their wallet. So like users can easily access them, which we all want, right? We want users using, trying out these different apps because we want more transactions. We want more a more diverse ecosystem. I mentioned about learn what works, what doesn't. So, you know, maybe if you reach out to someone saying, hey, I got this tool, or you guys have this tool that I'd like to use, and they could give info, hey, you know, you should use this versus that, and this works, that doesn't. All right, co opetition So uh, I mentioned this, I talked about the features, how Domly launched that first, and you had four other business follow suit quickly because it was a good idea. Now, is that copying, right? Um, copying in this case was quite effective and it is, it is competitive, yet it is cooperative, right? Because Baymail doesn't necessarily compete with Streamanity, yet they copied from a different business, but that works out to their advantage. And then uh, you can see Jack Lou kind of taunting the Volt guys who also uh, have a pretty sweet wallet saying that, uh, <laughs> they're also going to add this in-app browser, which is great, right? I mean, that will just let people decide, okay, is Volt better? Is RelayX better? You know, it's out there for everyone to decide kind of which wallet they want to use. So I think it's great for others to kind of implement what others have built because that shows what's working in the market. And you could do it better, right? You might see what someone else did and you say, hey, I can, not only can I copy this, but I can actually do it better and I can bring more users and get more Bitcoins because of my unique application. All right, Tonic Pal. So Tonic Pal, I'm glad that they have, uh, they've been more uh, vocal on social media lately and we've seen lots of offers out there. So if you're a business, you should definitely be creating offers and funding them with, you know, it could be a small amount of Bitcoin and then you, that way you get users sharing this stuff. And we, uh, if you're not aware of Tonic Pal, it's uh, the, I think the primary use case for it right now is being able to fund offers with Bitcoin. And then when the people who share it, they get paid out every time someone clicks the link. 
So I know me, I'm constantly checking the offers page for stuff that I can share out on social media. And I've earned a decent amount of Bitcoin from doing this. But not only did I earn some Bitcoin, but it also spreads this app or whatever this is throughout all the other people that hold Bitcoin. Because, you know, a lot of us are following each other out there on social media. So we see this stuff, we click on it and we see, oh, new app. Maybe I should go try that. So I think we have an incentive to use something like this. And I think any business should be putting their offers out there. Uh, recent, this was a few months ago, but uh, Ryan Charles and uh, the creator of Peer Game, Jeff Pike, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that, but um, they did a great interview talking about some of this. And Jeff suggested that if you're still on Twitter, you should follow as many BSV accounts as possible. And they're easy to identify because they all have their hand cash handles and they're shilling for tips and stuff or their money button paymail. So they're pretty easy to find. So if, you, if you're a business, you should follow as many as possible. They'll follow you back and you kind of grow this network higher and outwards so that you could reach as many people as possible. All right, so now I'm gonna transition a bit and talk about how micropayments enables the new internet. So this, this is a, sort of a controversial twitch, but I think it's a, it's a bold one, but it's the entire B, pre-BSV stack is obsolete. So I don't not, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with what's stated here, but I do believe that micropayments make a lot of the stuff added to the internet obsolete. So that's what I'm going to get into in the next few slides. So everyone knows this quote from Ryan, uh, use every problem with Bitcoin can be solved with Bitcoin. So I think with a, when it comes to implementing these old protocols, uh, let me go ahead and get into those. So like HTTPS, DNS, SFTP, OAuth, a lot of this stuff is added because the internet is inherently insecure. But some of these solutions, depending on what you're doing, are not needed when it comes to building out your business. So I'll just say this straight up. I hate seeing something like OAuth implemented when we have much more secure and sensible ways of logging into an app. OAuth is something that's a terrible user experience, but it, I get why it was made, right? Because there, it was made in the absence of Bitcoin. But when we have Bitcoin, if I have a wallet and I can just sign a message and just demonstrate, okay, I'm the owner of these keys or whatever, that's all I need to do, right? Um, then the micropayments and security. I know Craig has talked about this a lot. If you have a wallet, maybe you have a hot wallet sitting there with $4 that's running a bot, do you necessarily need to secure that with a crazy amount with, you know, what, 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 with what people do today? Probably not, right? Because it's not even worth the $4 that's in the wallet. If it's gonna cost me $100 to secure $4, that's, that's nonsensical. I would rather lose the $4 and not even probably triage the problem because it's just $4. I would spend more time figuring out who hacked and stole my $4 than, than what the hacker stole, if, if even a hacker decides it's worth it, which it's not. So it, I think we just ask with micropayments and the ability to hold small amounts to do different tasks, we really got to rethink security and why these protocols were created. And you know, I, I know like with SFTP, I've implemented that in my past job. And it's just terrible. It's just too much. Like you have to, like they're paying consultants all these hundreds of dollars to implement this stuff. It's like, well, you know, in the new world, do we nest, do we need that anymore? If if this cost of if the risk is lower, then the cost of security becomes lower. Also, when you're using micropayments, we don't need lots of info. I'm going to get into this because this is one of my favorite quotes in the white paper. It talks about how the companies have to harass their customers more info because they're not giving the money straight out. And if they do want money via credit cards, they have to ask for basically everything that the user's ever done. They need address, they need shipping address, they need name, they need phone number, email. It's just crazy. Um, so I'll get, I'll jump, I know I'm jumping around here a bit, but I'll come back to that point about the collecting information. Um, but harping on the login thing. So Back a couple of years ago when Streamanity implemented, they abandoned the Cashport login and they implemented Google and Twitter. They were heavily criticized by Bitcoin users by that. 
because lots of people are anti Google and Twitter and they would rather log in with their Bitcoin wallet because Streamanity shouldn't care who the user is if they're getting money from them. So I, I just, you know, I talk about OAuth, I talk about this other stuff, email, username, uh, passwords, all that's worse than just signing some challenge message from the platform, whatever Bitcoin wallet they have, because it doesn't matter because they all use private key, uh, private public key, um, ECDSA. So there's no need to implement different weird login systems when all users have a, the same wallet, essentially. Um, even if whether it's hand cash, whether it's money button, whether it's sent me, it doesn't matter. So uh, I think Streamandy made a mistake here and I hope people can learn from it. Okay, so it, this kind of goes into CAPTCHAs. So CAPTCHAs are also another thing that was created because the internet is insecure. They basically want people to prove that they're not a bot. It's super annoying, people hate this. Uh, you can see this funny meme here. So shout out to Chris Meza Kappa. I think that's his, I say his last name, right? For that awesome Craig meme. But no one wants to click that crap, right? Like if I'm, money button is a great solution for logins. Like if I'm just swiping, that is a captcha, right? And that can optionally be a Bitcoin payment. So what, don't, there's no reason to implement this other stuff. Like I don't need to prove my email ownership over an email address and a password if I'm just gonna give you money. Like that's, cause the whole point was just make sure that you're not a bot. Bots don't have any money, so they're not gonna give you any money. So I just wanna emphasize here, I think Bitcoin kind of deprecates CAPTCHA. Money button's a CAPTCHA. And a Bitcoin transaction or signing of a message, that's a CAPTCHA. Proof of work is also a CAPTCHA. This is also in the white paper. And it's one of the reasons that it's implemented is that um, you need to demonstrate some type of, um, effort in order to prove something that you you know you can't you know proof of a email address is nothing i mean we saw that recent twitter hack so um i just i really think this is hopefully this can kind of shift the thinking that it's been happening with the with the old internet paradigm bitcoin is just greater than the internet i'm not saying that it's going to replace it but i think there's just a lot of things we don't need those stopgap solutions created in its absence so I'm highlighting that quote here with the possibility of reversal need for trust spreads, reversal of payment. Merchants must be wary of their customers hassling them for more info than they would otherwise need, right? And I think when we lower that and we also reduce our risk, right? If I don't even have to collect your email address and store it in a database, my business has less of a cost because I don't have all this customer info stored. So it's that cost for securing goes away, the cost of storage goes away, thus my revenue rise, uh, my profit margin rises as a result. So we shouldn't bring that stuff into our Bitcoin business because it's just, it's handled by the, by the network. Micropayments just completely obsolete this stuff. So we saw this recent Twitter hack where, you know, they've got all this data sitting on their servers and the, you know, the issue with Twitter is there's no micropayments. That's why they got to do all these ads and you know all these social media influence get lots of followers and they make money from it because people go to their pages people follow them and they see all these ads but um you know when 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 people are paying you two cents per interactions you don't need to know your customer right like i don't need to know who you are like i don't why, why would i grill someone <laughs> for any type of information, if you're giving me money every time you use a site, like Twitch or Streamani is a great example of this. Like they don't need to know anything. They just need to know that you got money and you want to pay them. As long as you're not doing anything illegal. I mean, that's, I think that's the key here. All right, so to sum up dues, I know I focused on kind of the internet stuff, but I think that's important because I really do think that building a business, you don't want to spend, like, I think spending, if you were to start an internet company maybe three years ago, I think that this is kind of a mentality shift because if you look up, okay, you know, I need to implement a login system. I need to store X, Y, Z in a database. I need to secure this. I think a lot of those costs, just 95% of that goes away. Not saying that you need to store it on chain or anything like that, but I just think there's not a need for it because if you have, if you are taking micro payments or if you're taking any type of payment, you, it drastically lowers all of that. 
So I just want to get in do's and don'ts here. So do leverage tools that others have built. So meaning don't re-roll your own stuff. Uh, do charge for your time. I think I do want to see more of this. I think this is something I'm going to do myself because I think lots of information is just sitting in people's brains and we want a way to get extract that out. And I think making people, making yourself available and being incentivized to do so by being able to simply take payments for a phone call is a great thing. Do fundraise on chain, because like I said, I think that commit uh, holds you accountable as a business, but also has a clear communication with what you're willing to work on. And do pay your employees out and outputs. This is something I would love to see more. I think it's uh, continuous motivation. I, I know that, uh, it's, I've noticed this over the past year or so, is that every so often I'll just get addicted to trying to get more Satoshis. I don't know, I can't really explain it, but whether that's Tonic Pal, posting on any of the social media sites, uh, shilling streaming links, whatever it is. Um, I just want to get, I mean, humans are greedy, right? We want more money and we love seeing number go up, which I think the more important one is the Satoshis in your wallet. And then don't, so some of these might be controversial. Um, do not build your own wallet. So I'm not saying don't build a wallet. I'm saying if you're running an app that does, you know, if you're running like a blog site, I don't think you should build your own wallet. I think wallets should allow their users to just seamlessly log in with the PKI that's provided to us by the ledger. And that's it. Like if you build your own wallet, that's not time you're spending on building your app that people want to use. Because if you build your own wallet, no one's going to use that wallet. They're going to use money button or hand cash, right? They're not, no one's going to use your in-app wallet that is only for your app. I mean, yes, it could be used for other ones, but my point is, is it just makes more sense to work with the wallet providers to just uh, normalize the login versus um, rolling your own thing. Do not run a full node. I don't know how many times this has to be said, but it's getting even more and more crazy, especially with these stress tests. We still have stuff going down. No need to run it. Uh, there's so many tools out there. Unwriter's got, there's different APIs. It's just, I know Zoken just came out with something this morning, but it's just no need to run your own node. Um, here's something else, not taking functionality away. So I talked about that example with the Google and Twitter logins for Streamanity. In that case, they took away a Bitcoin login. Um, I know there was some stuff there with hand cash and cash port, but it, it just, it's not a good signal to your user when you take something away. Um, if you put in something, don't remove it later, especially if it's widely used, right? Because you're going to do nothing but alienate your customer base. And then my last point, do not implement legacy login systems. I, I've seen comments from people out there on social media that they don't even want to enter a username and password because of how bad the, the hacks have gotten. I mean, it's, it's just so crazy out there with, you know, people just holding, I mean, email addresses are valuable. We know that because of how many spam emails we get. Businesses do not want to hold on to this stuff, but they have to today because they feel like this is the only way. And my assertion is that it's different now. And I really think that, you know, I think it should be as simple as uh, signing, pressing a message to like produce a signature from your wallet, the back end of the app validating that and then letting you in because you're about to give them money. And that's that's really what it's about. All right, I, I mentioned before that the internet's a mesh is something Craig's talked about. I, I think that the more we think about the small world network, it's not just the ledger. I think it's the people associated with it. And we think about that when it comes to running our business, how we want to connect with each other, how we want to cooperate and compete with each other and also share ideas, keep the line of communication, be friends, all that sort of stuff. I really think it really is a small world. All right, so that's it for my presentation. And now I'd like to take the questions. So anyone, the, the, the questions are, are currently open. Um, Josh, you've been through a, a few of the tools. Um, I, I'm actually kind of uh, interested to know if you were building an app uh, today is uh, uh, any particular kind of uh, uh, set that you would pick? I mean, um, uh, fundamental functions, I think you identified a few there. So you, you need to be able to interact with keys. Um, uh, you need to be able to create transactions. Could you maybe, um, without picking any favorites here, give us a, an example of a tool chain that, uh, that, that, that would allow you to um, 
handle the whole flow of, of being able to create a transaction, get it onto chain. Yeah. So I think the obvious choice for logging in at the moment and broadcasting transactions is money button. I do think while money button has implemented OAuth that there's a better way to be able to log in uh, because it, it supports the crypto operations API, which just allows you to sign and encrypt and decrypt. So I think there's some, I think Unrider has already implemented that kind of with the palping. Like there's no OAuth there. I think you just sign and then you're in. Um, and then as far as fetching data from the chain, I found Bitbus to be quite useful. So there's two different endpoints to get confirmed and unconfirmed transactions. Uh, the only nuance there is that you have to match, do some matching between, uh, to make sure there's no duplicates. The unconfirmed set is kept over a rolling 24 hours. But you can query those APIs with your same query, and then you can get everything you need, and the APIs are quite fast. And now you have all the data that you need to display to your user. So you mentioned the um, the palping uh, onboarding experience with Money Button. This is more a question about Money Button than it is about palping. Um, uh, for for me, that was uh, that was simple because I already had a Money Button account. Um, now, bearing in mind that uh, a palping user might be someone who actually doesn't even have a, a Bitcoin SV wallet, uh, how do you think Money Button could improve uh, that sort of that that flow for for the user to simplify it? And do you think they should to simplify the login? Well, for the for the new user that doesn't have a Money Button account, you go to palping, and all of a sudden you're on this other site called Money Button. What's what's this Money Button? Why am I making an account? Yeah. Well, I think they're, I'm not sure if that's a month, like, because e even if the user signs up for the money button, that's still kind of a hurdle, right? I mean, to your point, I think that's more of um, a, like palping, I think. Yeah, I mean, at the minute, money button's convenient, but I think overall, it's, I, I, I foresee where we need to support different wallets, but the different wallets kind of standardize how you log in versus addressing that problem directly, if that makes sense. Certainly. All right, well, we've had a, a flood of questions that have just come in um, and I think you should be able to see them on your screen now. Uh, so first one from Kevin, do you think that Steve Jobs and uh, the next platform or the next machine influence some of the projects happening right now. So I'm not familiar with Next, but I definitely think Steve Jobs uh, had a huge influence. Um, I know we see that with Handcash, how they really seek to make it, uh, make Bitcoin wallet for just anyone. And it really looks smooth, kind of more like the typical financial apps that we have. So um, next was uh, was a, com a computing platform. I'm not sure if it referred to the machine itself or the uh, or the operating system that was running on top of it. Um, but it was a miserable failure. Uh, in fact, it was. Uh, I think some people speculated it almost sent Apple under. But um, uh, just for the background, that's that's what it is. Uh, I, I actually am a, am a great believer that failure can make it for man or or, or woman or or person. Um, I've had a, a few failures in my life that drove me to, uh, to, to the next project that actually worked. So um, we have an anon question here, um, which touches on the subject of logins. Uh, can a legacy login, um, can a legacy login not also be used to get people into a Bitcoin login? Um, I suspect what he's talking about or what they're talking about here is um, uh, as a, a, a gateway, I suppose, for people who are, are more familiar with um, uh, non-Bitcoin style experiences. I mean, I think maybe now, yeah. But like if I sign up for a wallet, like for example, Simply Cash or Relay, I don't have to give any info. I just download and I can immediately start using it. I don't have, I don't get prompted with that silly screen about signing with Google, Twitter, Facebook, blah, 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 blah. Um, I just, I download it and I can use it. So um, I think people want that. I think any type of hurdle, I think there's lots of stats out there about the more barriers to entry, the less likely a user is going to use your app. 
So I think we should just go ahead and remove that. Because I mean, if they're gonna log in to a Bitcoin app and pay, they need Bitcoin. I mean, we just, that's something that's just gotta happen. So I just, I don't, I, I've been thinking about this issue for a long time and I just, I think we should just move away from it. That's, that's my view. Sure. Um, another question on the subject of logins. Um, do you think uh, that OAuth login with traditional services should be used purely as a way of building an identity? Um, example, uh, a login with Bitcoin, prove identity with Twitter. Is there a role for, uh, for, for off-chain identity in establishing a, a Bitcoin-based identity? Um, perhaps now as a way of onboarding new people. I do think in the future, I mean, identity has become sort of a coming soon meme on SV, but I really think identity is one of the major use cases. And I know Craig has talked about how it's firewall, which basically means that the service doesn't need to know all this stuff. They only need to know certain parts about you. So as you build sort of a reputation against a set of keys on chain, and you know, this is not to say that code is law or anything like that, but or that private key represents an identity. But obviously, if you see if there's a pay mail that's linked to a pub key, and you see that pub key, okay, they've sent 50 pay mails, they posted 80 twitches, they've uh, funded I don't know how many things on Streamanity, they've done all, they've uh, been into um, pal, they post on palping a lot. Obviously, that is a reputation, right? So I think validating something like that, where they you can see provably that they've interacted with these different services and spent lots of money, that is more um, powerful than just validating some email address or some ownership of a Twitter account, which we know is problematic, right? Because of all the bots. Certainly. Uh, so I'm having a technical difficulty here. I meant to highlight a question and I accidentally uh, archived it. So, um, <clears throat> uh, John Pitts is asking, um, what do you think is the most differentiating feature of using Planaria's suite of tools? Um, uh, and then again, runs tools. Um, can you also talk about a limitation that, that each one has? So, the, I'll address the limitations first for anything Planaria. The limitation is I don't think it's fully worked out how to deal with when there's lots of volume on the network. Um, so that's an issue. So if you are, you know, uh, as soon as there's a million transactions on, on chain that are unconfirmed, um, you might have performance problems. Run also has the same limitation because of having to go back. I do think that can be solved at some point, but um, if like if you have a jig that you've updated a hundred times, it always needs currently it always needs to validate the history. There needs to be stuff in place where you only have to check a certain amount back instead of you know checking the full chain. Um, so those limitations are both and a differentiating uh, sorry differentiating feature of the Planaria set is is uh, the concept of serverless. I think. So I know I've used Bitbus to um, just be able to get whatever I'm interested in. You know, it's a simple API call, which every dev knows how to do. And then you can use it from any language. So I think that's pretty nice. And then Run, Run is establishing, even though it's not public yet, it is established. It's already used in lots of apps, but it's already establishing uh, the this idea of an NFT, non-fungible token or an object on chain which I think is probably going to be the most powerful use case that we'll see in the short term. Is as we start seeing you know, game items and that sort of stuff, we know that's getting popular in the mainstream. And the idea of having that on a single chain that's referenceable and open to everybody, I think the uses for that are pretty unlimited. So why, why is uh, it, it powerful to have it on a single chain? Um... Is, is this an interoperability uh, thing? That and the fact that everyone can see it and use it and not have to ask you. Like I know in my past integration work, I mean, you're talking about weeks or days to congregate and talk with the vendors and scheduling the time. And then that's the other thing is it's only nine to five in that world, right? But now all these people all over the world are working on this. If you just see, okay, they're adhering to the run protocol, I look at the chain, you can even look it up on your, all on your own as long as you have the hash. 
I mean, when you talk about that barrier to entry coming to through the floor, now you just let people off to the races and start coding versus having to congregate and coordinate meetings and understand the spec. You can just look at it. Um, on the run thing, um, uh, you, you mentioned the, the issue of um, having to validate kind of long chains of, of history. This is a well-known problem in, in token space, which is generally survived, uh, solved with some kind of a checkpointing system. Uh, in Bitcoin, we call those check, uh, checkpoint blocks, but in um, second layer tokens, uh, there, there's always kind of some other mechanism. Uh, often it just means go back to the issuer and um, have to reissue the asset. But uh, um, it's an interesting, um, uh, I say, problem to understand because it's uh, it's one of those very very engineering style trade offs where um, the solution uh, in one situation could actually be a, a problem in another situation and um, and vice versa. So we've got another question here from. Constantinos uh, about paying employees in outputs. Uh, do they get paid 100% in outputs without a base salary? What is the current practice across Bitcoin startups? So I don't know the financials of the different businesses that do it, but I do think based off what I've heard that this does happen. Um, as far as the base part that may exist, that may not. Um, I think we are too early. I, you know, I'm kind of jumping the gun about it, but I do think uh, I wanted to talk more about the positive aspects of it, because like I said, if you get notifications that are basically saying you got paid every so often, I mean, everyone, everyone knows the meme about, I, I just got paid this Friday. We're going out. Right. But, uh, you know, that makes people happy when they see that, that ledger entry on their bank account, but now you can get that, you know, hundreds of times a day. I just think that, that kind of flips the script and that kind of keeps people motivated to working. And it also, you know, base salary, I think that it kind of implies that you're working fixed amount of time. Uh, with this Corona thing, we're already seeing the impacts of, okay, now everyone's at home. What does that change? You know, does a base salary make sense anymore when you can work seven days a week during any time slot versus previously the Monday nine to five or whatever. Um, so, you know, we're still early, but, um, I do think that once once the company does have some revenue, I think this outputs thing will be pretty interesting to see. Sure, I, I have in the past uh, at various times uh, either taken all of or some of my uh, my own pay in, in Bitcoin, and um, um, being on a monthly cycle, uh, it was a common experience as payday kind of arised uh, 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 came. You know, came close I'd be sitting there watching the markets going oh is it going to go up is it going to go down and when it went down I was like oh I hope they pay early this month and if it went up um oh, sorry yeah um and that meant that there were some months where I was over the moon because uh, I got paid just after the price over had a big spike and, and others when I was um, quite unhappy because it just uh, just dipped uh, and one thing I certainly wanted or would have craved would uh, be at the very least to just uh, be able to take it kind of on a daily basis to, to smooth things out. Yeah. And the low fees make that possible. Yeah, certainly. Um, so I have a, we've got time for just for one more question. Um, uh, Kevin, I'm sorry, I don't actually understand what your question means. So, um, uh, if you want to uh, maybe re-ask it and uh, we, we can ask yeah. or we can answer it later. Um, so Monk is asking, uh, oh, sorry, more of a comment, uh, like how Powping is storing them. Um, okay. Question for both of us, guy. Both of us. Uh, does it make sense to you to conceptualize the off-chain storage of transaction data packets as an object that can be then pushed onto chain later on? I think so. Yes. Um, I think. Yeah, especially if it's malleable. I think that's pretty interesting, um, because you could have many users do some stuff to it. So um, 
when uh, the feature stuff first happened, uh, one of the hand cash devs, he made a comment that it should be using the SIG hash flags with the crowdfunding model, which I 100% agree with, but the wallets do not, um, no, no wallets allow that currently. But that would be an implementation of what this question is asking. So you would basically have a Bitcoin transaction that's unpublished and let everyone contribute to it such that, uh, say, 50 BSV is committed to that output. And then only then does that transaction become valid to be able to broadcast the network. So um, that's an implementation of this question. Um, I, I actually think it's a, it's a really interesting, fascinating question because it points to a, an engineering uh, kind of analogy. So in, uh, in coding, we, we have this concept of mutability and immutability. And of course, we talk about immutability endlessly uh, when we're talking about Bitcoin. Um, so, you know, a, 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 um, a data object in, in code um, typically is either mutable or immutable and some classes are designed to be immutable so that as soon as they're made, you, you have certain guarantees about the fact that they will, they will never change. Um, when you've got those guarantees, um, that allows you to safely do things that you otherwise wouldn't have been able to do. In Bitcoin, though, for example, uh, Josh mentioned malleability. I mean, a payment channel, for example, um, is an example of a um, of a mutable uh, transaction that's constantly changing and evolving. And the act of pushing it onto the chain um, is the act of locking it down and and, and turning it into an immutable state. Um, so, really interesting question because it, it highlights a very important property of of what Bitcoin does in terms of that state transition from mutable. Uh, mutable to, to immutable. In, in your talk with Craig yesterday, which I thought was great, Craig brought up a point that blew my mind about having multiple in lock time transactions mm -hmm. that are all set to the same time, but it, the input could be the same. So you could have where a user is given a choice to pick well, only one of those, because only one could be valid. If as soon as one's broadcast, every single other one has been valid. I think that's super interesting. Yep. Uh, I mean, it, it leads to the um, <laughs> the rather dynamite um, uh, expression of, of, of a conclusion, which is that double spending has a valid use case. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sure that could create uh, all sorts of ructions on, on Reddit if, uh, if we went to the subreddit and said that. Um, anyway, I, I think we've uh, run out of time. So um, thanks very much, Josh. That was, uh, that was a great talk.